What did we learn during our study of 1 Kings? This is the question we seek to answer today as we conclude our study of the book of 1 Kings on walking through the Bible. We have now come to the 68th and final lesson of our study of 1 Kings. If you have missed any lessons and would like to rewatch this series, you can find all of them at eastendchurch.org by searching under the media pull-down menu for the WTTB English podcast link. So having now completed our verse-by-verse study of 1 Kings, it is a good time to reflect upon what we have learned. The book of 1 Kings took over where the book of 2 Samuel left off, dealing with the final days of the reign of King David. In chapter 1, we find that David is old and sick, so much so that Adonijah, David's oldest remaining son at the time, tried to seize the throne before David died. This was told to David by Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba, and David had Solomon anointed king over Israel, fulfilling the promise that David made to Bathsheba, though we can be certain that God approved of such a decision. Shortly after this, David died, having ruled over Israel for about 40 years. On our timeline, we dated the death of David to about 970 BC. Solomon was a young man when he took the throne, likely in his early 20s, and very early on in his reign, God appeared to him in a dream and told Solomon that he could ask for anything that he wanted, and God would grant that. Knowing his youth and inexperience, Solomon asked God for wisdom in order that he might righteously judge God's people. God was pleased with this request and so made Solomon wiser than anyone who had come before him or after him for that matter. He also made Solomon the wealthiest king Israel would ever have and Israel's territory expanded to control land from the Euphrates River far in the north to the river of Egypt in the south, the river that divides what we would call the Sinai Peninsula today from Palestine. Thus fulfilled the promise made to Abraham back in the book of Genesis. It was during Solomon's reign that the temple of God was made by Solomon in Jerusalem, a grand structure that took seven years to build. Solomon also built a palace for himself that was more grand than the palace built for David. With the temple and Solomon's palace being built, the city of Jerusalem expanded to the north with land purchased from Aruna back in the book of 2 Samuel that enabled this expansion. But even though the reign of Solomon began well, It did not end well, for Solomon loved many women, most of these being foreign women, whom he took as wives. These wives led him away to serve idols in addition to God, something that angered God. God punished Solomon by taking away the peace that that he had enjoyed for much of his reign and told Solomon that in the days of his son, the kingdom would be torn in two. And that's what we saw after the death of Solomon in about 930 B.C. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, took the throne, and the northern tribes came to Rehoboam with an ultimatum. Lower our taxes and burdens, and we will serve you, or we will leave and form our own nation. Instead of Rehoboam acceding to their wishes, as was the advice of Rehoboam's older counselors, Rehoboam took the advice of his younger counselors and told the northern tribes that they would wish for the days of Solomon, for under him their taxes and burdens would be even greater. This led to a revolt from the north who made Jeroboam their king. Rehoboam tried to quell the rebellion but was told by God to stand down, for this was from him. And so we have the northern nation being known as the nation of Israel, while the southern nation being known as the nation of Judah. Only Benjamin and Judah formed the southern nation, while the other tribes formed the northern nation. It should be noted that the Levites also came to dwell in Judah, as the temple remained there, and that's where their service was to be. Now God told Jeroboam that as long as he served him, God would establish Jeroboam's house forever. However, due to fear that because Israel was commanded by God to go to the temple in Jerusalem three times a year for the feasts of Passover, weeks, and tabernacles, and they might like to, re- uh, and they, when they returned to Jerusalem, they might see it and desire to return to be a united kingdom once again, Jeroboam set up idols at Dan in the north and Bethel in the south and told Israel to worship there instead. This is the sin that would ultimately lead to Israel's captivity by the Assyrians some 200 years later, for God was angry with Jeroboam and promised him that he would tear the kingdom from his house and give it to another. 
Ultimately, Jeroboam reigned over Israel for 22 years, bringing the timeline down to about 909 BC. But ultimately, God would make good on his promise, for Jeroboam's son Nadab would only reign over Israel for two years, most of it being co-regnant with his father, before Baasha of the tribe of Issachar killed him and took over as king. But Baasha was no better. In fact, none of the kings of Israel, all the way down to their captivity, would remove the idols set up by Jeroboam, leading to great instability in Israel's kingly succession. All in all, first, in 1 Kings, we saw Elah, Baasha's son, come after him and reign for parts of two years. Zimri reigned for seven days. Omri reigned for 12 years. And Ahab reigned for 22 years, bringing our timeline at the end of the book down to about 853 BC. This would encompass three dynasties of kings as succession did not simply pass from fathers to, father to son. It would be during the days of Ahab that we meet the prophet Elijah, a man whose goal was to bring Israel back to God. He showed Israel that Baal wasn't God through his challenge to the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, but this didn't bring Israel back to God. In fact, it caused his own life to be in danger, showing us that miracles will not turn a hard heart back to God. One has to have a heart that desires to follow God, and then and only then will he be receptive to God's message for how to do that properly. The book ends with Ahab's death, something that was prophesied to Ahab by the prophet Micaiah due to Ahab's treaty with Ben-Hadad of Syria and his silent approval of the killing of Naboth in order that he might come into possession of Naboth's vineyard. This led to Ahab's son Ahaziah taking the throne, with 2 Kings dealing more with his reign. Meanwhile in Judah, we find a mixture of good and bad kings, with the difference being whether they served God wholeheartedly as David did. Rehoboam and his son Abijam were both bad kings, and thus only reigned for a total of 19 years, while Asa and Jehoshaphat were good kings, and thus reigned for 66 years. The book ends with Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram taking the throne in Judah in about 845 BC, though his reign will be completely covered by the book of 2 Kings. As for the author of the book, tradition holds that Jeremiah is the writer. Jeremiah is believed to be such for three reasons. The first being the prophetic tone of the book, where the success or failure of each king of Israel and Judah is judged based on whether they obeyed or disobeyed God. The second reason is that the style of writing is very similar to the book of Jeremiah, while the third reason is that there are statements throughout this book of certain conditions remaining to this day, which indicate that the author must have lived and wrote this book in the period before the Babylonian captivity. However, it is impossible to prove that Jeremiah wrote this book, and ultimately it doesn't matter, for whoever wrote it was inspired of God, meaning that God directed this person what to write. Besides the narrative contained in 1 Kings, though, the book does teach us some overarching lessons. First, we see that God is a God who keeps his promises. Back in 2 Samuel 7, God made a promise to David, that his sons would sit on his throne, which would ultimately lead to the Messiah. We see God keeping that promise here in 1 Kings in spite of some evil kings in Judah. Along with showing the fulfillment of God's plan to David, the book also shows us the foolishness of following after idols, for they are merely man-made objects that can do nothing. Elijah proved this on Mount Carmel while simultaneously proving that Jehovah is a God who is real and can act in his creation. And because of this, 1 Kings teaches us that, that obedience to God will bring success, while disobedience leads to personal and national disaster. Whether this physical success is, is physical success or spiritual success, God desires us to be followers of him from the heart and to abandon all forms of idolatry and sin that will separate us from him. He wants us to obey him fully. With that, then, we conclude our study of the book of 1 Kings. The Lord willing, in the next lesson, we will be continuing on in, our, in the Old Testament and begin our study of the book of 2 Kings with an introduction to that book. We hope you'll join us for that discussion as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out the whole world.